All right, everyone, if I can kindly ask you to remain in your seats. Um, we're going to start session three, um, or panel three, but session four, Healing Yemen from the War, Messages. No. Session three, considerations on the future, the possibilities for peace. Um, allow me to introduce our renowned moderator for today, Mehdi Hassan. Mehdi is an award-winning British journalist, a broadcaster, author, political commentator. He's presenter of both Upfront, filmed here in the United States in Washington, D.C., and Head to Head, filmed in the Oxford Union. He's a senior contributor at The Intercept and host of The Intercept's Deconstructed podcast. He's been named one of the 100 most influential Britons in, on Twitter and has included an, annually in the global list of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world. And you must catch his show tomorrow night where he interviews <laughs> Eric Prince on human rights violations in Iraq. Thank you. Ahdi. Dahlia, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure, privilege to be with, here with you all. Um, it's been described by the United Nations, as you know, as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Not Syria, not the Horn of Africa, not Burma, but of course, as you well know, Yemen, the poorest country in the Arab world, currently blockaded, besieged, bombed by some of the richest countries in the Arab world. Many of you here know the stats, tens of thousands of people killed, maybe more than 100,000 wounded, uh, more than 2 million people displaced from their homes, a record 1.2 million cases of cholera, 10 million Yemenis just one step away from, Yemen, from famine. 24 million Yemenis, more than four-fifths of the population in need of food, aid, or protection, according to the United Nations. Is it any wonder, then, that a senior UN humanitarian official said last year, and I quote, the situation in Yemen today to the population looks like the apocalypse. The apocalypse. But here's a statistic you may not have seen. And it, as a journalist who's tried to raise awareness about Yemen in my own uh, media organizations, it's a statistic that fills me both with anger and with shame. Last summer, the US media monitoring group FAIR pointed out that on MSNBC, one of America's top cable news channels, liberal progressive news channel, the US-backed Saudi-led war in Yemen had not been mentioned for an entire year, for 12 months straight. Zero news segments on the US-Saudi war in Yemen. And in that same time period, 455 news stories on Stormy Daniels. There's your point of comparison. Just this past week, we had a new report out from a coalition of US and Yemeni human rights groups, which found that American and British-made bombs may have killed or injured nearly 1,000 Yemeni civilians, including women and children. 122 children killed by US or UK made bombs in Yemen. Will that get any traction, any major coverage here in the US, or will the media continue to just obsess over the latest tweet by Ilhan Omar on the subject of Israel? That seems to be the only story in town right now, until the next crazy Trump tweet, but will Yemen ever get a look in? Is it any wonder that Amnesty International and others have dubbed the conflict in Yemen the Forgotten War, a conflict that we have averted our eyes away from? Our collective indifference, and I say this as a journalist, has been both a travesty and a tragedy. So I want to thank both the Tawakal Kalman Foundation and the Center on National Security here at Fordham Law for hosting this global conference, for casting a much needed expert spotlight on an underreported, underdiscussed, underexamined, but brutal, murderous, and seemingly never-ending conflict. And so without any further ado, let's get into today's discussion, which is on the prospects for peace, on the prospects for justice in Yemen. The format is very simple. There'll be opening statements by our four panelists, two minutes, three max. Then a moderated discussion between me and the four panelists for around 20, 30 minutes. And then audience questions for about 15, 20 minutes, and then closing remarks from our panel. Uh, we have an excellent panel of genuine experts for you today who can really illuminate this discussion and enlighten us as to what is going on both on the ground in Yemen and in the corridors of power from Riyadh to Tehran to the UN in New York to London and Washington DC and they're going to answer my questions and I hope your questions about what happens next. Uh, Paul Williams 
is the former legal advisor to the UN Special Envoy to Yemen, currently holds the Rebecca Grazier Professorship in Law and International Relations at American University. Uh, Paul is also the co-founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group, a pro bono law firm providing legal assistance to states and governments involved in peace negotiations and in the prosecution of war criminals. Uh, Nabil Khoury is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Hariri Center for the Middle East. After 25 years in the US Foreign Service, he retired from the State Department in 2013 with the rank of Minister Counselor. Nabil served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Yemen. Uh, just over a decade ago, I believe. His commentaries appear on the Atlantic Council's website in The Hill and on his own blog, Middle East Corner. Uh, Ibrahim Qatabi uh, is an expert on Yemen, senior legal worker at the Center for Constitutional Rights. He also serves as an advisor to Yemeni Nobel Peace Laureate Tawakkal Karman and was a lead advisor on the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda. He's a frequent commentator on Yemeni affairs and he co-founded the Yemeni-American Coalition for Change during the Arab Spring. Uh, Bushra Nasser Kretschmer is the founder of the Sabah Consulting Services. She's an expert on finance, economic development, has been in this field for more than 15 years. She has worked with various international financial organizations and entities, including USAID and the Malaysian government. She's also a fellow of the Women in Conflict program at the Beyond Borders nonprofit in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, give your panel a round of applause. So, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Nabil, why don't you kick us off <laughs> with your I'm the opening mean, remarks? I'm the, I'm the meaning, your mo. I guess. Okay, uh, in two or three minutes, and I know that Mahdi is a tough uh, mediator and questioner, and that he will hold us to it. Uh, so very briefly, there are three points uh, I want to make to uh, leave my own sort of opti-pessimistic uh, view of Yemen, as uh, President Marzuki said. Number one, all wars come to an end, believe it or not, and Yemen is no exception. So please do not despair. This too shall pass. This too shall end one day. Number two, the Yemen war, as complex as it is and as complicated as many people call it, and they complicate it even further in their descriptions of the complications, it's really simple, comparatively speaking, compared to other wars in the region. There are <clears throat> certain keys to this conflict. And if you touch on those keys locally, regionally, and internationally, you can and must resolve this uh, disaster uh, in Yemen. Thirdly, there are obviously <clears throat> uh, three layers to this conflict. The local Yemeni level, the regional level, which in, in involves the regional big powers and small wannabe big powers in the region as well. Um, and uh, the, the international level, which involves mainly uh, Western powers, although there are others trying to sneak in, trying to offer their advice like Russia, but it's really mainly the US uh, and Europe at the international levels. The problem with, with uh, peace uh, envoys, uh, with all due respect, is that they have uh, mainly focused on the local level because that's where they can have leverage with the warring parties. All Yemenis want peace, they want this war to end, and therefore they respond. They don't want to be blamed as the spoilers. They come to the peace talks. The problem with the peace envoys from Jamal bin Omar to uh, Griffith, uh, Martin Griffith now, is that they have no leverage on the regional or the international powers. And therefore, they have no leverage on the Yemeni participants in the war to implement. So they bring them to the talks, they even shake hands on agreements, but then the implementation cannot be done without the region deciding that it really wants to end this war, and the US and Europe. The US and the UK are the partners in crime, uh, in my opinion. And until today, they have not made up their minds that they truly want to end this war. And that's my opti-pessimistic view. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Bushra, over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mahdi, and thank you very much for the audience. Um, 
I'm here wearing actually three hats. I'm a woman. I'll talk for the woman. I'm representing the Yemen for Women Network, and I'm an economist, and I am Yemeni. So I'll be talking a bit emotional as well, because this is really hard, uh, breaking the, what's going on in Yemen. Um, it is Yam, Yam, uh, it is women who uh, uh, it is women who uh, is mostly affected by this crisis. However, women is always absent from the politics and and from the uh, uh, peacemaking processes. So I urge here that women should be represented, especially that she is the householder in this war and she is the one who bears the most economic uh, 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 burden in this war. The second aspect I will talk about here is there are th layers in this, in, this, in this conflict, but there is one layer that never mentioned or discussed in the narrative or in the media, is the economic layer. What brought this conflict to happen is the, uh, the fail of the state, the economy. The country was before this, the, the war before, after the transitional justice, the, the international community supported Yemen with the transitional justice, but after the transitional justice, everybody pulled out, and that's what happened. So, let me just uh, give a, a quick uh, background about uh, the situation going on in Yemen. Uh, there was the assignment of Dr. Ma'in Abdel Malik, the new uh, prime minister of uh, uh, the uh, prime minister of the uh, government. As soon as he uh, assigned, there was some improvement in the uh, financial uh, currency uh, uh, exchange rate. It, it, it went from 810 uh, riyal per dollar to 560 riyal for, uh, for dollar. So this is a good improvement when it comes to, to facilitate for the people to, to buy, per, uh, purchase uh, the food. And the uh, well, payment of salaries for 40,000 retired people, and uh, recently they announced that they're going to pay for the health sector and for the uh, 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 and for Hodeida people. So, though these these improvements has been uh, doing well, but they are not by themselves stand by themselves are, are enough. So um, there are projects that are implemented by the World Bank. Uh, funded by the World Bank and implemented by SFD and SMAPS. These projects show really uh, good examples of resilience programs and, and uh, sustainable develop, uh, uh, for sustaining this, uh, uh, the, uh, for pe people to sustain in this conflict. So some of these uh, <coughs> projects, I will just mention quick, uh, that they have managed to uh, uh, provide agriculture pro uh, projects for farmers where they have uh, been able to um, recruit 1,700 farmers who recruited 22,000 workers for short and long-term uh, jobs. 40% of those people who are working in these farms left the front lines. So these projects provided food security and peace. This, what, this is what Yemen needs. Actually, what, the, what we are listening that the, the humanitarian crisis, Yemen needs aid, aid, aid. There are a lot of food on the market. The problem is in the purchase power, and this is by the report by the World Bank. The problem is in the uh, demand, it's not in the supply. So what we need, Yemeni need, we don't want to have another example of Somalia. I just want to, I have a pro prepared a long uh, paper, but okay. I got. I just want to say here that Somalia has received over 55 billion since 1991 making it the top recipient of aid. These funds, unfortunately, did not help Somalia's economy. Rather, they helped to deepen corruption, weaken the economy, and fuel the conflict. And Yemen, tragically, is on the track to follow this example. Uh, the complete dependence on relief on donation is not the strategic uh, economic approach needed for, to lift Yemenis from the crucial uh, uh, crisis. And I have many recommendations how we could support the state economy and how we can support the security to bring in peace through economy development. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Busha. Um, Ibrahim. So um, if we are about to bring peace to
CMN, um, I think the, uh, the agenda has to be, uh, to be um, people-centered. We always talk about fighting parties, we always talk about war criminals, but we never talk about the population of over 27 million people. So if we are to talk about uh, peace, we have to see what the people want to begin with. And the next, the next point is uh, we need to talk about accountability. The problem that we end today is just because we don't have accountability. The international community, along with the Saudi um, and, and the GCC uh, countries, gave the Saleh regime immunity, which allowed him to basically stage the coup along with the Houthis. That's the problem that we have in Yemen today. We cannot talk about peace when we given uh, stakes to, when we given the platform for war criminals, um, they're supposed to be blown behind bars. Uh, I think the problem in Yemen has to do, one, with accountability. The first thing that we need to do um, to achieve peace is to end the war. We need to put an end to the war. The humanitarian disa disaster cannot be used as a bargaining chip. We have to lift up. All the blockades has to end, whether they the, by the Houthis, internally speaking, inside Yemen, or the, by the Saudi UAE-led coalition. Um, we cannot talk also today uh, about the so-called legitimate government when it's functioning remotely from within Saudi Arabia. We cannot have a government functioning remotely if we are to have some sort of any kind of peace negotiation. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, currently, uh, the other problem is that um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia thought they come in to fight the Houthis in order to re restore the legitimate government, but what they end up doing, uh, creating their own militias loyal to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, undermining the actual government they claim to support. So that cannot continue. All throughout South Yemen today, we have secret t detention led by, by uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, we have countless human rights uh, violations from massacres to uh, kidnapping to assassinations to all kinds of crimes committed by these countries that are supported by USA and the UK and that cannot continue to be the issue. We cannot bring people to the table while we supporting them to do all these massacres and continue the war. So that got to stop then we need to ask the question about what the Yemenis want. And I think they spoke loudly uh, during the Arab Spring. They want a democratic system that everyone have equal access to it. Uh, distribution of wealth and power are to be distributed, distributed all across the country. Um, people are to, to be given uh, autonomy because we have so many internal issues from the Houthis to the Southern Movement to uh, Central, um, uh, um, you know, the central part of Yemen, because what we had during the Saleh regime is this centralized uh, government where one family, one tribe control everything and left everyone, um, you know, uh, struggling for their own. Um, so we need to know one, um, one, it's the humanitarian disaster, two, that needs to end, the bombing of Saudi Arabia and the massacres committed by Houthi needs to end. Houthi needs to submit um, to basically hand in their, um, their weapons in order to talk about peace. We cannot continue to have that. International community, including the U mainly US and the UK, need to help support the initiatives that uh, we need some sort of investigative party, an international uh, party to investigate all these crimes and, and, and hold these uh, war criminals accountable and instead of giving them the power, exactly what we're talking about today, bringing all these people who committed uh, crimes to be, um, to be rewarded with power. That gas to end and then we need to talk about people. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Paul Williams. Great. So prospects for peace in Yemen, big sigh. Um, war's end, as Nabil points out, the question is when and how. Will this war end before there is the large scale famine? And will it end in a way that it's actually durable and isn't just a pause, rearm, and repeat? The prospects looking at the Stockholm Declaration, which I understand we'll talk about in the Q&A a little bit, are concerning. Many months of, of energy and diplomacy to get the guys with guns, we call them the parties, but basically it's the guys with guns, to Stockholm to agree upon a half of a page framework agreement. Now, we've negotiated framework agreements in the past, and they're generally pretty thin, but we try to get them to page two or three. Um, this is just half a page. A page and a half 
a page and a half ceasefire, but an unsigned ceasefire. The first provision of the ceasefire says, this ceasefire shall enter into a force upon the signature of the parties. There are no signatures. There are not even signature lines. And you do have a TAS agreement, and it's a third of a page, which essentially says the parties, the guys with guns, will consult on what to do with TAS. There is room for optimism, because all wars do end. But there are four key puzzles that have already been identified by the, my fellow panelists that must be solved in order to end the conflict in Yemen. The first is accountability. As President Marzuki pointed out, there is a delicate balance between peace and justice. Peace and justice were not balanced in the 2011 Gulf Cooperation Council Accord. Article 1 provided for amnesty, impunity, for the president and members of his party. And we see what happened. It kicked us into this conflict. There's going to need to be a substantial mechanism for accountability as well as truth and reconciliation in whatever peace agreement comes to play. But you immediately hit the are you delaying an end of the conflict if you're trying to seek accountability. But without accountability, you may end the conflict, but it may be pause, rearm, and repeat. Federalism, just touch on it briefly, huge issue during the national dialogue, during the constitution drafting situation, seen as a panacea for Yemen. It is likely to reemerge as part of the peace process. Exceptionally, exceptionally difficult for any country to move from a unitary to a federal state, especially a post-conflict country, and especially a country without a long tradition of decentralized governance. Third puzzle, guys with guns, mediators, get agreement by getting the guys with guns to sit down and sign something. When you have an agreement with guys with guns, there's no room for women, as Bushra has pointed out, no room for youth, no room for marginalized populations. How do you build a durable democratic structure if you're just accommodating, appeasing, negotiating with the guys with guns? That puzzle must be solved. The fourth and final puzzle, before I get the high sign from Mehdi, southern questions. It's not just the southern question anymore, it's the two southern questions. It's what do you do with the southern interests, and then if the south pursues self-determination, either internally or externally, what do you do with Hadramat and their push for internal or possibly external self-determination? OK, I'm trying to be a, what is it, optimist, pessimist? I think I sort of came a little bit on the pessimistic side. Um, but let's throw it open to the Q&A. What was it Gramsci said? Optimism of the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, or something like that. Um, you advise the UN. Let's go backwards. You finished speaking, Paul. You advise the UN, right? Three special envoys to Yemen in the last eight years. That's a lot, some would argue. I was at a conference in the UK on Saturday where Yemen came up as a conference about justice, international law. And what was interesting was whether you're on the left or the right, there was a consensus view is that the UN is a waste of space in Yemen. The UN has failed in Yemen. Do you think the UN has a credibility problem in Yemen given the last eight years? The, I worked with uh, Jamal Benamar as his legal advisor, one of his legal advisors. The first invitation. Yes. The, the UN has a credibility problem. And I should also mention we've done a number of negotiations through PLPG in Syria, Libya, other places. The UN has a credibility problem everywhere, but it is oftentimes the only shop in town. And that's what the difficulty. There are no, if you look at the situation in Yemen, you can go through a long list of over a dozen potential honest brokers, none of which are honest. And so you're left with, you go through the usual suspects, you're left with the United Nations as the body. And so what you need to do is redouble and energize the effort behind the UN to bring the parties to bear, which is why this type of conversation designed to build public pressure is so important, because you need to get the major powers, the regional powers, aligned with what the UN is trying to do. As someone who's been inside that system and part of that envoy process, how much does quote unquote Western public pressure come to bear on things? Like how much was Ben Omar care, you know, looking at what people are saying back in the US or the UK. I mean, people don't poll Yemen, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. The envoys and the UN infrastructure looks to the Security Council uh, as well as the General Assembly, but it's the Perm 5 plus the other members of the Security Council that are the boss, so to speak. And that's where the public pressure is, is important. And I say this because oftentimes we go home and we're like, oh, what's on YouTube? Because you're thinking it's, you know, the, the activism on Yemen or Syria or other issues is, is, is you, you, don't, you feel like you're hitting a wall. But that is the pressure point. 
It's to get those governments to respond to civil society, to respond to public pressure, and then to implement that through the Security Council, or in some cases, through the General Assembly. Nabil, you opened uh, with your rather positive remark about all wars come to an end. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I'm from England. Uh, England and France fought for 100 years. They literally called it the 100 Years War. <laughs> I mean, just because a war is going to come to an end, let's talk time frames. When you look at Yemen, it's been at war, well, it's been at war for a long time, but the specific conflict we're talking about, four years coming up to, how many more years, if you were a betting man, would you say? So I was uh, born and raised in Lebanon, and... Uh, I know about long wars as well. It lasted for 15 bloody years in Lebanon. Eventually it ended, and the sad thing is when they went to uh, Taif, in Saudi Arabia, back in the days when Saudi Arabia used to mediate conflicts and not uh, 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 stir them up and, and fuel them, uh, they went to Taif and agreed on basically adjusting the Lebanese political structure in very minor ways. And the issue of Palestinian presence and armed Palestinian presence was resolved in a way that had already been agreed on before the war. So the war ended and should have never started. And if people are only rational about what is it that we seek, and we can just, believe me, if the Yemenis sit down, uh, really the heads of not, not 550 as Jamal bin Omar had, the leaders, eight or 10 of the main factions, and have a serious discussion about what's the end goal, what do we want to get to? But why wasn't that serious discussion in Stockholm? I think, in, in again, uh, the, uh, in Stockholm, the mistake, in my opinion, is that they focus on Hodeida. The port. And, right, because of the humanitarian crisis and the urgency on the port. And, it, uh, okay, so we achieved a ceasefire in Hodeida, which is, you know, wobbly, but more or less holding. But in the rest of the country, the war went on. Mm. So really, if you want Hodeida, okay, fine, Hodeida is the first step, but get a general ceasefire. I mean, nobody trusts that they stop in Hodeida while they are being bombed in, in Hajra yeah. or on the Saudi uh, border or anywhere else. So to get a general ceasefire, you want to get what, eight to ten of the top leaders around the table. Ibrahim, you said in your opening remarks, and it's a, it's a very powerful line, and I think morally we would all agree with you. Um, you said, put the war criminals behind bars. Given everyone seems to be a war criminal in Yemen, <laughs> who's left to negotiate? That's a million-dollar question, right? Um, <laughs> I think um, we need to start internally speaking um, and because the waters in Yemen and the Yemenis are paying the price. Uh, so um, the international community along with the um, Yemeni society uh, needs to push for some sort of, uh, like I said, a UN, um, like the, the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Council needs to establish um, a committee to investigate all these crimes. No, I get, I get the investigation of crimes. The, the, I'm wondering practically who is left to come to Stockholm or Taif or wherever the next peace conference is and shake hands and sign documents if all those people, as you rightly argue, in some shape or form have blood on their hands? We, we did Unless it. you're going to accept the we, fact we, we, that we, whoever's in charge of Yemen is going to have some legacy of having committed war crimes. So here is the deal. We need to focus on the people. We were able to, I know you need, um, we, need, we need to be able to bring people like we did during the national dialogue. So we okay. brought the so Houthis. So like a parallel. We brought the Houthis, we brought the um, Southerns, we brought uh, you Youth, women, 500 um, national dialogue conference would all came out with an outcome but that Nabil would, wants that would put ten people, not 500. Uh, well, the eight, ten people. That's um, who, who these people are: the Houthis and, and, and Saleh regime and uh, people that are backed by the Saudi um, and, 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 uh, and the UAE. These are the problems. These are the, the individuals that need to be held accountable. So we need to find a third way. We cannot keep talking about the same problem okay. uh, or the same individuals because it keeps leading yeah. to the same issue. We keep okay, going. Briefly, to Nabil responded. Um, two, two words, really. Uh, it, it's called truth and reconciliation. That's it technically was, three words. It was, no, I'm joking. That's a joke. That was a bad joke. You're Sorry, tough. It, it was tried in South Africa. It was tried in Tunisia, in Morocco, uh, after the years of lead of King Hassan II. What you do is you wait until you have peace, and then you say, you reveal all the crimes that were committed, you point and shame to the people who did them. And then you achieve national reconciliation and move on. If you focus too much, Mahdi is right. Everybody is a criminal, like Lebanese civil war. Who is left to run the government? But that's exactly what we had in the national dialogue. We need to go back to that point where we have a peaceful okay. transition. I, I would like to say that woman should bring peace. Yeah. 
And, and women will bring peace, actually. Because we have seen a lot of examples. I can give you a lot of examples from the ground where women have done a lot of grassroots peace and they have done ceasefire on the ground. And these women are not on the table. And, and women has been very resilient. I have just mentioned how important women should be on the table. Uh, I'll give you one example of, of uh, women has been uh, supporting, uh, res res uh, supporting uh, the uh, aid transfer and distributing uh, voluntarily. 75% of those women, they are the leaders of their, their communities. They are the future leaders. We should work with those people. We should work with those women. This is a new and a, a change in, in our uh, culture in Yemen. This is maybe, I can say, the only positive thing that happened in this war is that women has been empowered, has given some way that she is now taking the, the, the lead of many things, but she is not on the table. Um, I want to ask, I want to just expand on the point Ibrahim made about you know, holding people to account and liability. Even if we can't get people into a tribunal or behind bars, just in terms of acknowledging what is happening in Yemen from a moral political point of view, I'd like to ask all four of you, and I was interviewing Tawakkul just before this panel for my TV show, shameless plug, up front, coming soon <laughs> with Tawakkul Carmen. <laughs> What time is but, it? But uh, it's a few weeks. Um, the, but one question I asked her, which I want to ask all of you is, we know there are lots of parties to this conflict. We know a lot of them have committed war crimes on the ground. But if you have to single out a single party, whether it's a Yemeni group or an international organization or country, where does blame lie for this war? Is that too simplistic question? Is there one group, one actor, one person, one country where we can say, if you could sort that out, you'd be able to get some headway in the Yemen war? Paul. Wow, in most of the previous conflicts, Yugoslavia, you could point to the primary perpetrators, Rwanda, you could point to the primary perpetrators. Um, here, it's an all-in conflict, and this is why I think accountability is, is so important, because you're only going to erode the tradition of the elite political bargaining that has led to this conflict if you have a full court press on accountability and you aim to hold all of those actors. Now, the problem is, when you do that, the room is going to be empty until women, youth, civil society, and non-armed actors show up and fill that room in order to negotiate a durable but that's. That's Yemeni society. As we know, this is not just a Yemeni civil war. This is quote unquote proxy war between regional actors. How do you hold those regional actors to account? There was a report last year, year before last, I can't keep track of it anymore, where the UN wanted to put the Saudis on a list of countries that offends children's rights in Yemen. And the Saudis said, we will not pay you any money and we will not cooperate with the UN ever again. And the UN said, oh, sorry, that's fine. <laughs> so. How do you get past that as someone get, in that system? You get past that by, by redoubling your support for institutions like the International Criminal Court, which despite all of its flaws, has in some instances jurisdiction or could be given jurisdiction. You create a hybrid tribunal like Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone. You go for an international mechanism. Again, it's not a panacea, it's not a magic wand, but you want to invoke those mechanisms of international justice who do have the reach to do the investigations and to hold those culpable individuals liable for their crimes. Uh, Ibrahim, do you think we will ever see the Iranians or the Saudis or the Emiratis in front of the International Criminal Court, realistically? I think everything is possible. We have seen criminals before that, and, and I think we will have to see that again. Uh, when the people have the power and the will, um, every criminal ha has to be held accountable. Going back to you, um, question about the pressure and what needs to get done in order to bring people to, t to the table. We've seen for the first time the US Congress pass a resolution against the biggest ally in the Middle East, against Saudi Arabia. So people's pressure count. If there are a number of countries who stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. That builds a momentum and a pressure for peace. Uh, I think we need to build on that. I think the international community and people like you and me can build that momentum in order to at least uh, uh, stop the war, at least stop the bombing, at least uh, lift up the, the blockade of, of, of the country, allow people to move in and out of the country without any, uh, any problem. So these are the first steps to be taken, and we have seen it. I mean, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, 
created a momentum for Yemeni. CNN was not talking uh, about Yemen for over a year until the killing of, of an individual actually sparked that kind of movement internationally. We've seen some real movement, and we need to capitalize on counting that. And I think at the end of the day, Yemenis have the will, but they don't have the support of the international community that really uh, let them into the bus exactly what's happening so in Yemen today. Nabil, is there a finger that you want to point in a certain direction? Uh, two fingers, <laughs> actually. <laughs> A uh, very simple answer for your question. The war was started by the Houthis who uh, took Sana'a in 2014 and overthrew the Hadi government. <laughs> Number two, however, the Saudis jumped in and took advantage of that and fully exploited, boycotted, and hammered the hell out of Yemen uh, for their own mirage of, of pretending, and the Trump administration fuels that, that they are fighting Iran uh, in Yemen. They're not fighting Iran in Yemen. Iran physically is not in Yemen. So they're fighting a mirage for their own interests. And right now what you do is, rather than lay blame, is roll things back. You roll back the Houthi uh, coup which uh, took place by guaranteeing them whatever demands, legitimate demands they had at the beginning of this before they took over Sana'a, and you roll back the coup. You roll back the Saudi Emirati invasion, and it is an invasion because they and their militias are all over Yemen. Now They, may they would say they're invited by the legitimate government of Yemen. Who, which is uh, sleeping in a five-star hotel in, in Riyadh. That's the legitimate government. But, but they may have had legitimate security concerns. Fine. Deal with that, but roll back the invasion, get the Saudis, the Emiratis, and all their sundry militias out of Yemen. Um, Bushra, you mentioned earlier in your remark, you know, this is emotional for you. So when you look at what's happening in Yemen, where do you point your, we could talk analysis in a moment, where do you point your anger and passion? Where, where is your emotional energy directed towards, against who, if I dare ask that question? If I may, um, I think what I would like just to make one, one small comment. I think there's uh, one issue that people should make uh, clear that sitting on the table, on a negotiation table by all those parties, one important thing that the Houthis or the Hashmet, political Hashmet, should get rid of the supremacy notion that they have the right to rule. This is number one. We have to be just on the table. <laughs> after, that, after that comes everything, as Nabil said. I agree with him totally. And, and one, one, what makes me feel really, really devastated is how difficult the people of Yemen are having difficulties. They cannot move from one place to another. There is a difficulties even, I mean, I, I worked with the private sector, I worked with the financial sector, I worked with the central bank every second, third day I was at the central bank working with them, helping them to bring in new tools. Today, the financial sector is not working. This is really, really devastating. And the financial sector is the core of the economy. The sovereignty of the central bank is the core of the economy. If we don't have a proper control of the monetary uh, cycle, of, uh, of the, then we, will, we don't know what's going on. Black market will go in. We will be having, uh, buying, uh, black, um, what do you call it, tourists, Compacting, to, uh, we have to, uh, um, what do you call it? I'm getting very emotional now. <laughs> laundry, money laundry can take place. And this is what should, why we, I say the economy is very important. You we have to strengthen. You mentioned in your talk about, you, you know, there's, how do you support development? I mentioned that a UN official said Yemen looks like the apocalypse. When you have that level of destruction, in a society which was already a poor developing society to begin with. How do you recover from that financially? What kind, of, what kind of time frame are we even talking about here? Let's say the war by some miracle were to end tomorrow morning. What are we looking at the day after that in terms of reconstruction? Building the institution's capacity of the, of the government itself, bringing in back development and bringing in back resilience programs and uh, bring uh, re, uh, the, uh, re, uh, re, uh, what do you call it? Is that, that it? Uh, to be an expert? Uh, yeah, bringing uh, experts back to, 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 to the country. And you have, we have to deal with um, making sure that the central bank also is looking after all the, uh, all the money goes in through the central bank. This is if, uh, uh, important. 
When it comes to uh, the areas where the Houthis are controlling, they have been uh, making sh the private sector, um, there are a lot of arrests for the private sector. They're arresting the financial, uh, the banking, uh, the head of the banking sector, and and they are uh, looming and uh, uh, looting the uh, the uh, uh, the telecommunication companies and the fin the, uh, the private sector with excessive taxes and etc. This is the only. This is the center of the country. And if the remaining private sector working there get out of that place, then it's really a collapse of the economy. In the highest population. So my, my, my point, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that a stable uh, and uh, secure economy is not just good for Yemen, but it, is, sh it should be uh, of interest locally, regionally, and internationally. Peace cannot be achieved if all parties have different interests. And this is what's happening now. Yemen's economy stability should be a unifying and a uniting factor for the regional security rather than using the youth as a fuel of the war. Yemen should be providing security and stability to its neighboring countries. And finally, uh, let me let retire that women should be part of this uh, solution. Paul, in terms of the aftermath, if we can be optimistic and say the war comes to an end, what role, we talk about the cost of it, that's the financial cost of reconstruction. What is the political cost of reconstruction in terms of international community, UN getting people together to actually deal with a post-conflict Yemen? So one of, the, one of the bright sides, if there is a bright side, is that when you do move into the post-conflict situation or environment in Yemen, you already have the outcomes of a national dialogue. There's 1,800 outcomes, so it's a little unwieldy, but you did have a national dialogue process, which as Bushra and Ibrahim have pointed out, highly, highly engaged women, youth, marginalized populations. And, and when I was there, there during that time, you could sense that there was no going back on this. And so there is a point of conflict now, but I expect when the conflict ends, you'll still have those empowered communities that will be at the ready to re-engage on issues of governance, reconciliation, justice, devolution. They also have a blueprint. 1,800 outcomes of the National Dialogue, and they have a draft constitution. And the draft constitution has some issues, but by and large, it's a modern democratic constitution that could be picked up and moved forward. So you won't be looking at a blank slate in terms of a blueprint. The political infrastructure is as devastated as the economic infrastructure, but you have a Yemeni blueprint for the democratic transformation of Yemen. Uh, Nabil, Ibrahim mentioned, just before I forget, the bill in Congress that's going through. Um, if it ends up, I mean, you've worked in the federal government, you're based in Washington, D.C. at a think tank there. If this Murphy-Sanders-Lee bill ends up on Donald Trump's desk, President Trump has yet to exercise his veto in his two years in office, will continuing the Yemen war be something he uses his veto to do? Do you think, if you had to uh, predict? Uh, I predict that he will veto it unless they come to some sort of a compromise agreement. Uh, <coughs> I think this initiative by uh, Bernie Sanders and Ro Khanna, uh, et cetera, is an excellent one. And it is one which shows Yemenis and shows the world that there is an American conscience and that there is a serious American attempt to stop this war. So I, I predict the, the bill will pass. I predict that Trump will veto it. And I think the chances are that Congress will be able to override the veto, although there's no guarantee here because of the play between Republicans and Democrats uh, in the Senate. Um, one thing I always find weird, Ibrahim, in this debate about Yemen is prior to the Arab Spring, and this conflict with the, and the Saudis and Jamal Khashoggi and everyone talked about Yemen. The only time you talked about Yemen in the West was to talk about Al-Qaeda and drone strikes. That was the only time Yemen made it into the news. Now no one talks about that at all. It's become a kind of, do you think that's an interesting aspect of this story? Should it be played up? I mean, we see in reports from the BBC, from Reuters, that the Saudi Emirati coalition have actually allied with Al-Qaeda groups on the ground. Is that a complication in all of this talk of reconciliation, the UN peace talks, when you have a group on the ground which Western countries at one time were obsessed with and now kind of aren't so obsessed with? I think part of the problem uh, in Yemen is the mislabeling of the country um, when it comes to the Al-Qaeda. 
when it comes to even, um, I mean, you mentioned in your introduction that Yemen is the poorest country in the world. It is not. In the Middle East. We had, an, an, even in the Middle East, we had the most corrupted regime in the world by the interna uh, 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 Transparency, uh, Transparency International group um, and supported by the most corrupted, uh, repressive regimes in the region. And that's part of the problem. So we keep labeling Yemen as the poorest and that plays to you know, prolonging the, the conflicts. The, um, the, the other part of it, when it comes to label in Yemen, we, also, we always, in every single newspaper in the West, that Yemen is the backyard of Saudi Arabia. When you have a corner store that oversees two seas, and 70% of the world trades go through it, and you label it as the backyard of a desert, we have a problem here. <laughs> um, then the other, the other problem here that people don't talk about is the international struggle for power. Yemen is an, one of the most important geopolitical location in the world, and that's part of the conflict, and we don't talk about it. So that's a real issue that so, we... So on the subject of geopolitics, Nabil mentioned in his opening remarks that this war will not come to an end until the region decides that it wants it to end. Do you see any evidence that the region wants the Yemen war to I don't, come to I end? don't think so. If you see what's happening in the South today, it's controlled by the UAE and, and, and Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, there is a movement now within the Southern that actually supported the beginning of the, um, of the Saudi UAE-led coalition just because they occupied every single island that Yemen has right now. And there is no uh, Yemeni government presence in all of our islands. The seaports, airports in the south are controlled by the UAE. Yemeni ministers have to be checked by the UAE uh, offices at their own airports. So we have a serious problem right now. They're only interested in that part of the country, and that's why they're letting the problem go right now, okay. because they control the seaports, the airports, and the location they need to control right now and to maintain the problem uh, inside Yemen. That is one interesting thing that we need to point out here, especially in the West, is that People keep talking about the Saudi-led uh, strikes in Yemen, which they committed massacres and, 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 and war crimes. But also, the Houthis are one of the biggest problems in the country. It's not different than the KK and the US. They think they are an elite group, a sectarian group, that have the right to control the, the future and the lives of Yemenis, and that's part of the problem. We don't talk about it here in the US because, because we think we don't care about it. Because of the U.S. foreign policy, that's what we need to focus on. If you issue is about a democracy, is about accountability, then you need to support the Yemeni people, and you need to hold every war criminal accountable, whether they're Houthis or Saudis or UAE or even the Yemeni government. And that's what we need to discuss going forward. Okay. I mean, the Yemeni people have the will to do it. They need the support of the international community. Do you think that, just one quick question, do you think that complicates the narrative, you talk about putting public pressure, which Paul mentioned, you mentioned, here in the West on, you know, on, on outside powers. Does it complicate the narrative that there is no easy good guy, bad guy narrative? That you want to be able to say, it, it I want to condemn the Saudis, and I want to be able to condemn the Houthis, and I want to condemn the guy sleeping in Riyadh, that, and I want to condemn all of them? That's like the, the Al Qaeda problem in Yemen. Yemenis have more weapons than we have people. During the Arab Spring, they so came out peace, peacefully. They didn't fire one bullet. So we cannot mislabel 27 million people because we have war criminals that are supported by regional powers okay. and international powers. So we need to move from those kind of misconceptions that were created by some US or you know, world news agency that funded by certain groups that want to see some sort of um, um, system in the country, Yemenis for the past two decades, supposed to be, Yemen is supposed to be a democratic society, and Saleh hijacked that system. Uh, Saudis are, don't want a democracy next door. So what is the Western values about democracy? Okay. What is the support for that? And I think we will overcome, like President Masugi said at the end of the day, that we will overcome. Okay, I want to come to the audience. Just before I do, one quick practical question uh, that we didn't really get in time to get into. Uh, Paul, the Stockholm Agreement, you mentioned it in your talk. I believe they didn't even sign it. They just shook hands. There was no actual signatures. Uh, Nabil mentioned it's shaky, but it's helped in the port. Has it been a net good or a net, a net positive or a net negative in your view in the last few months, couple of months? It's been a distraction. It's... it's it it provides some principles, it provides some momentum, but if you can't even sign the framework agreement and you cannot begin to implement the ceasefire agreement, <clears throat> then that becomes the new norm. You're going to need fairly <coughs> substantial strides in order to end this conflict um, and baby steps. Um, 
The next time around, it has to be a stride, okay. and not a baby step. Okay, let's take questions in threes. Can I ask for questions and not speeches? Um, we'll go to the gentleman in the hat. Then we'll go to the gentleman here. Without then we'll go to the lady in the glasses. Hello, uh, my name is Brody Elkins. I'm from uh, New York University. I'm just a student doing Elkins. some research. Um, <clears throat> I have a question just for the panel. Um, do you believe uh, Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood al Islah are playing a role in the Yemeni's crisis? And if so, does it alarm you that um, Ms. Carmen has shown to have direct ties to them financially? Okay. Uh, question there for the student. Gentleman here. Here. Uh, this panel discussed idealism versus realism. Account accountability without teeth. Managing demand and supply without supply. Layers of conflict that is basically con uh, controlled externally. How about the human resource? We have a generation uh, that knows or the only knows the way of life is a weapon AK-47. We also have a brain drain. Uh, for the last four years, all the brain have left the country and coming back. I'm is worrying not... this is turning into a speech. Is there a question? No, at no, the end that's of this? it. That's it. The point about human resources. Got it. Thank you, uh, lady in the glasses. Hi. Uh, I want to ask uh, about geopolitics. Why there has to be uh, some major event to happen so the world could care. First, it was the Qatar crisis, and then Al Jazeera started to care about Yemen and report nonstop about Yemen. And then second, it was Jamal Khashoggi. Do we need another Jamal Khashoggi? Do, ne do we need another regional crisis so peace can prevail in Yemen? Um, okay, do you want to take those? Who wants to take those questions? Do you, want to deal with, do you want to deal with the first one? Since you're an advisor to the Tawakal Kalman Foundation, the gentleman who wanted to ask about Qatari, Isla, Muslim Brotherhood, financial ties. There are, there are a lot of interventions in Yemen. Um, everyone is trying to get a stake because, again, because of the geopolitical location of Yemen and because of the struggle for power between different GCC countries, including Qatar and the UAE and everywhere. Um, in, in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood or the Slah Party in Yemen, which they consider a region of the Muslim Brotherhood, Yemenis, um, as long as you don't carry weapon and kill people, as long as you enter uh, the, um, you know, the system in a peaceful way, whether you're Houthi or Slahi, Yemenis don't have problem with that. As long as you carry weapons and, 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 and trying to achieve um, political goals using violence, all Yemenis are against that, whether you are a Muslim Brotherhood or Houthi. So as far as a lot of people know, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is not engaged and, and, and um, the, the Houthi-like sort of uh, uh, militias, they part of the, with the so-called the um, uh, legitimate Yemeni government until we see that. And that's why we called for an independent um, investigative party to investigate every crimes committed by all sides. We don't care who, who committed that crime and we need accountability. So we can't just keep pointing fingers without finding solutions and, and holding uh, war criminals accountable. But as, as far as going forward, Yemenis need political parties and any kind of groups to enter the political process, process peacefully without using any violence. And I think that's a huge agreement for Yemenis. Okay, does anyone want to take the point about human resources and young people? Do you want to go with that? Yeah, um, I think there's a very important uh, point that the people, uh, the region and, and uh, should understand that Yemen is very rich in resources and it's very rich in human resources as well. So we should start building a strategic relationship, not, not what's going on right now. The, the amount of money they put in, in, in the weapons, I think they should invest it in the people. And, and we have to, I, I was working with a project with the USAID for, for supporting building the capacity of the Yemeni youth to, to, be, to work in, in, in the Gulf. And that was one of the uh, programs that I was working on. And that was a very important program for employment. So this is one of how we can b bring in strategic re relationship and cooperation. In your experience working with these organizations, whether it's USAID, whoever it is, do you think there are enough attention and recognition is given to this gentleman's point? No. 
Unfortunately, it has been on a lot of speak about how could Yemen be, be part of the Gulf region, but never happened. Especially, we were, we were thinking, we, we started uh, talking about labor market, bringing in labor market, and then it didn't work out. Okay, Nabil, do you want to take the lady's question here about events sure. in the Middle East? Uh, yeah, Afrah uh, Nasser's question, I think, on uh, do we need another Khashoggi? Uh, unfortunately, it's true that for Western media, particularly American media, once you could visualize it in the life of one person that was taken, it dramatized it, it brought it home, particularly someone who worked in Washington with the Washington Post. So it, it increased uh, the media attention, the spotlight, and that, to some extent, has helped uh, generate or speed up the movement uh, in Congress. However, I don't think, uh, in the end, that in itself and another individual crisis wouldn't be enough to resolve this problem. In the end, you need political action, regardless of how much media covers or doesn't cover. You need uh, political action in Congress, essentially to simplify, the US turns off the tap which has been fueling this war. The Saudis and the Emiratis in turn turn off their tap which has fueled all these militias and mercenaries uh, running around uh, Yemen. And in the end, you get the Yemenis together. And frankly, the region is not all Saudi Arabia and, and uh, UAE. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, question about Qatar. I think Qatar was a benevolent force in uh, Yemen before this whole thing started. When I was still there and at the London Donors Conference, I encouraged the Qataris to lead a peace uh, negotiation in the north between the Houthis and Saleh at the time. Uh, because they truly could be a bit detached from the problem, unlike the Saudis. But or they, to... The lady's question about the, the, the spat between uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, the blockade, how has that played into the Yemen conflict? Has it had a major role in that? Well, uh, essentially, uh, Saudi Arabia has blocked uh, Qatar's peace initiatives in Yemen for at least a decade now, if not more. And that, to some extent, made, uh, got Qatar out of the GCC effectively. And so GCC became a force in one direction, rather than a force that could genuinely uh, mediate. So yes, it contributed. It also contributed to intimidation. Qatar is out of the GCC largely because it wouldn't uh, uh, follow, toe the line behind Mohammed bin Salman. And uh, because they didn't agree to batter Yemen as the Saudis and the Emiratis. Although they were part of the original coalition. The Qataris they, were part they, of the coalition they pulled, that, pulled that bombed. Of that. They pulled out. Okay. And so it intimidates opposition. And Let's go back to the audience. Let's take the three questions. Lady here. Hi. Gentleman behind you. I'm just going to identify three people. And the young man over there with the beard. Hi, I'm Dr. Bailey. I'm a physician from Connecticut. And I'm here after listening to this all day. I just had two questions. One is, if the country is so divided north and south, have you ever thought of just dividing it? Uh, which is what uh, has happened in some African countries. And the second issue is that sounds to me today that Saudi Arabia and the GCC has been involved in Yemen from the beginning of time. Those countries are not democratic. Why would any one of them want a democratic neighbor? So it doesn't seem okay. like even if you end this war, you're really going to end Yemen's problems. Okay. Gentlemen. Uh, being that everybody agrees here, Zaid Naji, a Yemeni-American activist, being that everybody agrees here that uh, it is uh, a proxy war. And all uh, day today, and especially in this panel, we've been hearing about advocacy to stop Saudi Arabia, which is fine. And all, anybody, uh, we Yemenis who, who live next to Saudi Arabia understand that role. My question is, is any one of you guys advocate to stop the other part of this equation Houthi and Iran. Did anybody advocate? And, and I'm going to uh, end by saying this. Uh, Yemenis at the ground understand any effort that only stop one party is going to fail. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, gentlemen there. Bishra Nasser, I think you have mentioned that Somalia received one point something million to improve the economy, and the economy did not improve. What do you think is the best solution to improve Yemen economy? Okay, um, do you want to take that one first briefly? 
Yeah, actually Somalia received 55 billion since 91, and it didn't help anywhere. It ended nowhere. And even after the drought, they have been uh, bringing in lots of funds, and, uh, and it, it, they didn't help the farmers how to prevent our, our be protected from the drought. So this is not the solution. Solution is development. Solution is bringing in skills development, tech technology, upgrading the farmers, upgrading the people with the latest. And one of the solutions, I think, is, is bringing in technology in financial technology, financial inclusion. And uh, just to mention that the WFP has introduced the biometric system for ending the corruption, because corruption is like 60% of the aid is confiscated by the Houthis. So this is one of the major reasons of starvation. And, and then I just I have also the statistics that 70% of the aid is, is for operation costs. So what's left for the Yemenis? Nothing. And, and when the WFP lately, after Stockholm uh, agreement or, or consultations, not yet agree, after Stockholm consultation, he has been mentioning that there is uh, there have been thefts. The Houthis are thefts for the aid. Seven landmines have been found in the silos. And they have bombed one, uh, the, the, the storage of the aid of WFP. So these are violations, starvations for them, for the people. It's, they don't care about starvations as long as they are achieving their goals. This is one thing we should understand. I, and, and when it comes to Somalia and Yemen, okay. we are in the 21st century. So we can bring in technology and bring in a better methodologies to administrate okay. and operate. Ibrahim, gentleman's question about focusing on Saudi, what about the Houthis? I'm pretty sure I heard you talk about the Houthis earlier. Do you want to expand on that earlier, about accountability on all sides, putting pressure on all sides? I think, like I mentioned earlier, the Houthis are just another militia, and militia never wants to be a government, and they, they always achieve um, their pro political goes through violence, and that's not what Yemenis want. So they another militia, sectarian militia, that I don't think the Yemenis will accept. And if it, if it wasn't for the intervention of Saudi uh, UAE in the south and, and, and creating another militia, I think the Houthi would have died out by now. They're not targeting the Houthis anymore. They want the Houthis to, to, to control the south so they can control the most important strategic location um, and the Red Sea and the Arabian Sea, which were, were most of the world tra trades go through. Um, there are other points to, I found it and cool here to talk about Somalia as a bad example. I think Somalia is doing better than Yemen today and I, th I don't think we should go there. There was a question also about divided the country and maybe that's a, the, the right way to go. Um, that was um, discussed through the national dialogue. Would we have a lot of grievances in the south and the north and elsewhere? People agreed to establish a federal system, a decent, decentralized system. The problem in Yemen in the past is that we didn't have a system that actually delivers services to people and treat them equally. That was the core issue of all the wars in Yemen is that one group controlled the government, loots all the rest of the country like what happened after the 1994 war where Saleh regime removed all the partners from the south from power, looted their oil and everything for his own family and, and, and region. And that's part of the problem. Okay. And that's why we want to move away from these kind of system and establish a de democratic federal system, a, a decentralized system, that the main focus is to deliver services and good for, for, for the people and actually ensure that the rule of law and justice is applied to all okay. Yemenis regardless of their background. Nabil, separate the country, partition? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think a uh, free, independent, and unified Yemen is what makes sense and, uh, for everybody. It's in the interest of everybody. I just want to say briefly on the proxy idea that, of course, there is Iranian influence in Yemen right now if there isn't physical presence. Uh, but that influence is minuscule compared to the influence of Saudi Arabia, UAE, US, UK. And let me tell you a story. I was, my first day of arrival at the US Embassy in Sana'a in 2004 was the first week of the war, the Saleh Houthi Wars. We were pulled into the Ministry of Interior, their operations room, and we were told in no uncertain terms that th this was Iranian provoked and that because Iran is fighting Saleh, we have to be on his side. We asked our intelligence agencies to look into it from up, down, and sideways. There was zero Iranian influence in Yemen at the time. 
as the war continued, that, that influence started. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, exactly. And I sent that message after getting back to Washington. I sent that message to Saleh. And I said to Abdul Wahab al-Hajri, please take, take back to Saleh and tell him, the, uh, he keeps saying the wolf is at the door, it's going to come to the door. They are beginning to get interested. And this really sparked up when the Saudis first bombed North Yemen in end of 2009. The Iranians' ears pricked up literally and said, hmm, there's something going on there. Uh, if Saudi Arabia is interested, we should be interested. Mm. And since then, that, that influence has grown to the extent that they could, because there's a very tight blockade around Yemen. And as a result, the leverage of Iran even now is not that great. But I think given that Yemen is not a priority for them, for them it's Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, they would be interested in helping out. If you want someone to lean okay. on the Houthis a bit, I'm sure they would welcome the opportunity. Paul, the issue of partition was raised. Yeah. The yeah. UN has been involved in some partition plans in different <laughs> conflicts. Not all of them or most of them have gone according to plan. What do you think about partition in Yemen? Uh, no, I think it's important that Dr. Bailey raised the prescription of, of division for Yemen because it's, it's out there in the global community. There's like <coughs> 36 new states in the last two dozen years. Sometimes it works out okay, like Czechoslovakia, East Timor. Sometimes not, like South Sudan, the former Yugoslavia. Um, as uh, was mentioned by Ibrahim, it was discussed quite extensively um, and had its own separate eight plus eight channel of negotiations during the national dialogue. It will be back on the table. And if you're going to get to a unified, free, independent, democratic Yemen, you're going to need to come up with a way of navigating the tension between the North and the South and between two parts of the South and even with Aden City, um, it'll be heightened, it'll be doubled or tripled than it was during the CDC, during the national dialogue negotiations and the constitutional negotiations. And there needs to be some avenue to incentivize all of these, these, these multidimensional okay. characters. And the only way to do it is to move the political elite, the guys with guns, off to the side and bring in the eclectic representation of those 27 million victims to design a modern Yemen. We've got five minutes left. I'm going to poll the panel. Do you want to give closing remarks, or do you want to take three more questions from the audience? Questions? Jazz more questions. Good, a good, a good non-elitist answer. Let's hear from the people. Three more questions. Lady there is waving, so she can have a question. <laughs> Gentleman here has been waiting for a while. And who's the third and last question? You need a woman. Another woman. Where's another woman? Right there. OK, there. With a hand up. Yeah. With a hand up, obviously, is what I meant. Hi, um, my name is Rabia Althabani, and I'm a Yemeni American activist. I actually co founded the Yemeni American Coalition for Change with Ibrahim. Um, I just have, it's not sort of a question, Ibrahim, but it is a, <laughs> more of a statement. Um, I think we need to be really honest when we're talking about who is on the ground um, in terms of what groups are doing what. Al Islah is definitely a part of the problem. Um, Qatar, um, unfortunately, after what happened in Saudi Arabia, has become part of the problem, okay? And as Yemeni Americans, we, if we really care about this country, we have to be honest about who is involved. It's Qatar, it's Al Islah, they all are. At the end of the day, they all need to go back to the table. We can't just say, oh, they're all criminals or we're not gonna, no. I believe that, yes, I'm so sorry, it's almost done. Yeah. I just have to say this because I'm really passionate about it. Ibrahim knows that Al-Islah, Al-Salafiyin, Al-Houthi, they're all, they are all a part of this problem. So let's just be honest about it. And when people but are you ask saying you, they're part of the problem, they also have to be part of the solution? Definitely part of the solution. Okay, do you want to pass you. the microphone to the lady on the left? Hi, my name is Alison Kiel, and I represent a group that does syndication work between private industries and also um, governments okay. and leaders in power. Uh, my question um, is about human rights and accountability. Um, specifically, um, how can we hold leaders accountable when we have people like the former Human Rights Commissioner Mary Robinson complicit in Emirati and Saudi regimes, as in the case of the Princess Latifa case? Okay. Um, and then the, who's the third? Yes, question here. Uh, I know how the war will end. <laughs> if we look back into uh, Yemen's history in the 60s, there was a civil war that followed, you know, the uh, establishment of, you know, the yes. Republic of Yemen. It was called the Unknown War. And for almost a decade, Yemenis, you know, fought each other and killed each other. And the Saudi Arabia and King Faisal at that time was backing the royalists. Yeah. And Gamal Abdel Nasser was backing, you know, the Republicans. 
Uh, then, you know, uh, after what happened in 1967, with Israeli... We're running out of time, so I can't no, take the no, full no, post-war history. Last, last can sentence. We, can we, can we, go on. Jamal Abdel Nasser and Faisal talked. Okay. And they decided they're not going to get to fight anymore in Yemen. Okay. And then Yemenis were able to resolve things amongst themselves. So, the so you're saying the outside powers need to talk directly? Well, well they, they'll get exhausted or something will impact them or they get bankrupted. But, you know, Egypt was in trouble and Faisal, you know, they, they resolved it. And suddenly, all the people they were but, supporting... But this were, time, obviously, Saudi Egypt are on the same side this time. You're talking about Saudis and, say, the Iranians talking. Exactly. Is that realistic? Do you believe that's realistically going to well, happen anytime uh, soon? I think, you know, a similar scenario might happen. Okay. Panelists, do you want to respond to that? Paul, do you want to... We're going to go from left to right, and we're going to finish now with these. Do you want to respond to whatever you want to... Whatever you heard? Take your pick. You're not going to solve this conflict by going back and doing the old ways of business. You need a new way of business, and it has to be inclusive, and it has to look to a durable peace, not just getting the armed political elite to say, yeah, we'll put down our weapons, repause, pause, rearm, and repeat. It needs to be inclusive in order to be durable and effective. Okay, Nabil? Um, basically, I, um, I encourage uh, Yemenis, and particularly Yemenis uh, outside uh, of Yemen, uh, to uh, put down their weapons, their <laughs> rhetorical weapons, against one another. Uh, there, there, are en <laughs> there are enough Yemenis killing one another in Yemen. You don't need to fight one another here. Be supportive. If you disagree, please be polite, be respectful. Don't launch these campaigns, particularly against women. I've seen it. Women journalists and, and women commentators. Uh, you know, take it easy. They're your brothers and sisters. And disagree respectfully. And ultimately, you're going to have to work together to resolve this disaster. Thank you. Bushra. Yeah. I'll uh, just uh, uh, convey what uh, Paul said, bringing in the, uh, the grassroots or the civil society to solve the problem. The problem is that the, solve, the voices of those people is not heard. Who is today with us coming from Yemen? Who is today with us coming from Yemen to Europe? None, zero. If there is a ban. So how can we solve them? And then if we're going to solve them through the, through the militia who are on the ground taken by force because we're going to listen to them, I believe that we should get back to the national dialogue and start from there. Okay. And last but not least, Ibrahim, do you want to specifically deal with your colleague's point about at the table, not all just behind bars? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are a lot of bad, bad actors, um, including all Gulf uh, uh, countries. Um, the, the issue here, we have to have a difference between when someone is bombing your own civilians like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, you cannot compare that to Oman and Qatar. It's like a complete different world. You, running secret detentions, blockading the country, controlling the seaports and the airports is completely different than having... Okay. I'm, so, okay it's all interesting in the last 60 seconds. Okay, so... Um, um, sorry, we're going to have to give the last word so, to the panelists. Go on. Don't, so, 30 seconds. So I think what we need going forward is accountability. We cannot have peace without accountability. We need all actors and bad actors like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iran out of the whole thing. I disagree with, with, with Khoury about Iran have zero um, influence in Yemen when the headquarters of the Houthis are actually based in Lebanon and the head, um, their media propaganda, their machines, their support, what they're doing now in Yemen, going from door to door, trying to transform the society into okay. a different sort of Iranian, uh, idealism that actually have nothing to do with the Yemen. We're almost out of time. I'm going to give Bushra the last one. Just one, one last thing. I, I believe that we should just streamline the role of Saudi Arabia and, and whoever is uh, in the coalition. Because we see today the Hajur, and you just mentioned, they are bombing them with the ballistic missiles. So if we didn't, if the, the, the coalition didn't destroy the air jets, then the, the Houthis will be bombing Yemenis with Airplanes. So this is, this is also, we have to understand that we are talking with an ideology that we cannot talk to them. Okay. We're going to have to leave it there. Let's just give one more round of applause to our panel of experts. And thank you very much to the Tawakal Common Center and to Fordham Law for hosting this global conference. The conference continues. Thank you all. <laughs>